welcome everyone to uh, today's Soil and Nutrition Conference. I am not Dan Kittredge. I'm sitting in for Dan Kittredge just to um, do a brief introduction uh, for Walter Yenna. If you caught his March 13th uh, webinar session, um, he will need no introduction. He's a magnificent soil scientist, microbiologist, climatologist. Um, he's been helping us reframe our understanding of climate change and global warming and giving us the response ability, tools that we can use for making a difference in our local climate efforts. Thank you, Walter. Take it away. Okay. Look, good morning, everybody from down under in Australia. It's still very early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning here, but very <laughs> pleased to be with you because, hey, the soils don't stop and we mustn't stop either. Today, uh, I really wanted to talk about something really quite exciting, but it gets to the heart, not just of soils and the environment, but it gets to the heart of why soils matter to us and our health and basically the whole nutritional integrity of the food we eat and therefore our health and survival and future. So we're going to be looking at the processes governing the biofertility of our soils, our food, and our preventative health. And really, what are the actual processes through which life evolved from a nutritional point of view, and in a sense, how we've basically not understood those well, and as a consequence have built agricultural systems that have created a lot of problems for us. But let's go right back to the actual context of the challenges we have in front of us. There will be 10 billion of us on this planet by 2050. And 80% of us are expected to be living in cities. And those people are going to be completely dependent on external food supplies. And consequently, the food security, our security of obtaining enough food will be critical. We saw in the Arab Spring 2008 that perhaps only seven missed meals actually separate social stability from chaos. And of course, we've got an extreme um, policy and strategic concern because if we lose that stability, then the game's over. I mean, civilization's community really collapsed struggle. But there's something much, much more critical and more fundamental, but not so well recognized about our food uh, system. And that's actually the, the integrity, the nutritional integrity of the food we eat. And this is really fundamental because it's the actual integrity, the nutritional integrity of the food that largely governs our preventative health. Okay, there's some 96 natural elements in the periodic table, it's basically nutrients, elements that formed in the supernova, stardust when the planet first, or the solar system first formed. And basically over 50 of those elements are used in biology. Over 40 of them, we know are essential nutrients for life, and the biochemistry that governs life. And so really it's, it's critical that we understand, well, look, how are these nutrients taken up and made available in our food? Because we need those nutrients for our basic biochemistry and our health. We need those nutrients in the right forms, concentrations, ratios, and balances. So it's not just that we've got nutrient content, but actually they are very sophisticated. They have to be there in the, as we said, in the right forms, concentration, ratios, and balances. Okay. And basically we've disturbed that system, right? Okay. We used to get that naturally through our food, of course, but of course, through our recent industrial agricultural changes, we've had enormous effects on how plants take up nutrients and consequently 
the nutritional integrity of our food, and that's grossly affected our preventative health and is actually the basis of many of the diet-related self-induced diseases and problems that humanity, especially industrial humanity, is faced with now. You know, the obesity, the diabetes, the cancers, the cardiac, the autoimmune diseases, which are now exploding exponentially in our societies and really debilitating societies in an extreme way. So basically, if we keep business as usual going, then it's not just the lack of food, the food security challenge, but it's actually this whole nutritional health challenge that will cripple us seriously. Of the 8 billion people that are on the planet at the moment, some 800 million, of course, still go hungry. But over $2 billion, $2 billion not dollars, people are basically already overfed, overweight, obese. And effectively, most of us are sub subclinically malnourished. You know, we basically walking around, we're sort of functioning, but we're not getting and we don't have the nutrition, uh, the micronutrients particularly that we need. And so the question is, what has gone wrong? And basically, the question is, the way we've grown our food um, is actually being compromised. And so we've got to go back to understanding what governs that nutrient uptake. You know, what have we done to degrade it or change it? And of course, what can we do and must we do to actually restore it so as to prevent our, uh, restore our preventative health? Now, we've known for millennia from the Greeks onwards that really it's what we eat is really critical to our health. You know, the whole maxim that let food be thy medicine. And so what is it that we have to change? And basically to understand that, it's really valuable to go back to first principles and really understand how the whole nutrient and, uh, or the evolution of life and evolution of nutrition was based. So I'm going to actually switch to a overhead here that I've got. Now, uh, Liz will help me and tell me if I'm if it's aligned and you can see what I'm talking about. Can you see that okay? Yeah, that is lined up pretty good. Okay, good. Okay, because what we're really now going back to 3.8 billion years ago, and really while this is well before our time, of course, uh, this is really how life evolved and the nutritional basis of the evolution of life. Because basically we had that primordial soup, we had in effectively seawater around smokers, volcanic vents in the deep oceans. And we basically had little micro droplets that uh, formed with oil films around them. So in a sense, it's just little pockets of water. But what happened because of this oil film or these proto membranes, you had a process that started whereby some essential nutrients like phosphorus would be concentrated across that membrane. So whereas there may have been 20 parts per million outside in the seawater, inside that microcell covered with that membrane or surrounded by that membrane, you ended up getting higher levels to say 200. Can, at the same time, this proto membrane would actually operate by excluding some toxic elements. So if we look, for example, at something like aluminium, which is toxic to life, there may have been 200 parts per million outside, but then this proto membrane enabled the exclusion of these so that we only had 20 parts per million on the inside. So you ended up with a process, a simple chemical process whereby nutrients, essential elements could be concentrated and toxic elements could be excluded. So 
what I've tried to show here is that there's a difference between the external environment, the, in a sense, dead chemical soup, and the internal environment of this cell, you know, in terms of the nutrition that it takes in. So there's 200 inside of the things we need, only 20 of the toxic, whereas on the outside, it's a reverse. And actually, this is basically giving us a nutritional integrity, the selective separation of the nutrient concentration within the cells compared to outside. And we can do this experimentally. We can actually create such an experimental system, have a membrane with this selective uptake and get these same results in the laboratory. But then something very, very profound happened because basically as you change the internal composition, the chemical composition of these microcells, then you actually start creating bioenergy. And it's basically based on just simple physics, the electrical potential, which is the actual charge difference over the distance. And I mean, that's the, how it's calculated. So what we now have is basically much higher nutrient concentrations on the inside than on the outside. So there's a charge difference, but basically it's in a very, very small, um, on over very, very small distance, basically angstroms, tenths of a billionth of a meter. And so you end up with very powerful electrical potential because of that very small distance, the distance of the membrane. And actually that electrical potential then creates the energy that drives biochemical processes in life. Okay, so basically it's just simply by having this change in nutrient concentrations on the inside compared to the outside, it in itself chemically drives this electrical potential and that electrical potential then drives the actual whole energy of life. And this has actually been documented and written up in nature and what have you. And actually it's quite profound because that only had to have happened once <clears throat> in that first cell. And of course, then that cell grows and divides and you basically end up with life on earth, right? 3.8 billion years ago. So the whole basis of this is telling us that the actual basis of formation of life on earth and its perpetuation, functional integrity, the cells, and basically their, you know, that's particularly energy that it creates. Okay, and so basically, um, life formed in this very simple process, and for all of humanity, or well, not humanity, all of the last three point eight billion years, every cell has effectively relied on this process to get its nutrition. And life has actually been just a function of this nutritional integrity, taking up nutrients, concentrating essential nutrients and excluding toxic nutrients. Of course, if we break that membrane, then basically the nutrients just re-equilibrate, but in a sense, life ceases. So the fact, I mean, death is simply the loss of this membrane, the loss of this nutritional integrity. Okay, and so for the last 3.8 billion years, our whole evolution has been based on this process. And of course, initially it was in the oceans on these single cells, these prokaryotic microbes. With time, then it got more sophisticated as oxygen increased from these processes. We formed larger eukaryotic cells symbio symbiotically. That was a process whereby basically organisms would be able to join up together as communities and function better in more complex eukaryotic cells. That happened about one to two billion years ago. And then as evolution developed further. We had more complex organisms, multicellular organisms, 
and basically they again were symbioses of different cells forming colonies to be then a multicellular organism. Uh, and this is in a sense how life has evolved for those 3.8 billion years, always making bigger cells, but always relying on this nutritional integrity. Okay, and then for the 3.8 billion years, it's actually being this uptake and exclusion of nutrients, which has then governed the biochemistry of life. And actually it's been that way through all, all of our, well, I mean, all our agriculture, because up to the Second World War, we were in a sense just living in this process. We had basically plants that depended on mycorrhizal symbioses, you know, these extensive networks of fungal hyphae, which were effectively just membrane tubes growing throughout the soil. And basically they were then taking up nutrients in this exactly the same process. And of course, giving us the nutritional integrity through those fungi in the food plants that we had and of course, thereby governing our hands, our health. But that all changed. Now, I, I can show this all on the next overhead. And again, uh, just checking that you can see this. Is that all centered properly, Liz? It looks good. You could slightly move it to the left, just a little. I move it to the left, this okay. way? Yeah, well, now move it just slightly to the right, just right. slightly. Um, right. Can you? We're just getting a little bit of word cut off. I think that's just going to be fine. I don't. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. look, I can go back a bit, so it should be a bit bigger. There you go. Perfect. Right. Okay. So this now actually is really a very, very fundamental um, slide because it takes looks at now what's happening with the nutritional uptake by plants in nature versus the industrial hydroponics that we develop and have been dependent on since the Second World War. And as I was explaining before, all our nutrition depends on plants. And I've drawn a little plant here with its root systems. But in nature for the last 3.8 billion years, it's actually been these extensive networks of fungal hyphae proliferating throughout the soil and of course, these occur for 98% of our plants, all our food plants. And it's these mycorrhizal hyphae that have been forming this soil plant interface. And while, we, while it all occurs down under, so we don't see it, but there may be up to 25,000 kilometers of these fungal hyphae proliferating in a cubic meter of healthy soils. So it's a profound length of membrane interface. I actually also should explain these hyphae are effectively membranes. They're linear membranes and they're in intimate contact with soil surfaces, organic matter surfaces, and all involved in uptaking, basically uptaking nutrients from that soil. So it is this whole soil microbial ecology these fungi largely that drives the fixation, solubilization, access, uptake, cycling of nutrients. So it's this interface, this network interface that actually makes the availability of nutrients in our soil, you know, gives that availability and it also governs the biofertility of that soil. Okay. And so the whole question of biofertility is not how many nutrients are in the soil, but actually how available they are driven by these processes of fixation, solubilization, access, uptake and cycling, and all of those that govern by these membrane interfaces. And so really it's been a very, very sophisticated, profound system, which allows very productive biosystems to have formed with minimal nutrient inputs. So we have, for example, rainforests on sand dunes, 
you know, the world's most bioproductive terrestrial ecosystem, effectively on silicon dioxide, crushed glass, and it's so productive and so biofertile because of the efficiency and speed of these processes, because of these microbial ecologies, these symbioses, rather than the nutrient content of the soil. And in a sense, this is what we relied on for the past 3.8 billion years. Just as that first living cell, these membranes are concentrating essential nutrients, excluding toxic nutrients, working as an intelligent selective soil plant interface and giving us the healthy nutrition of our plants. Okay, but basically all of that changed pretty radically after the Second World War, because while we had depended on this natural nutrient plant uptake processes up to that, after the Second World War, we actually had the energy, the fer fertilizers, the biocides, but also I suppose the hubris to say, no, we can do better. And so what we did is we started going into concentrated industrial hydroponics and agriculture to be more productive, okay? To be productive by saying, look, we can actually cultivate soils, we can fertilize soils, we can use biocides to get rid of um, diseases and unwanted organisms and, we, and you know, weeds, competition, and basically saying, look, we can now live off this fertilizer nutrient that we're adding to the soil. But in doing so, what we do is we kill all these mycorrhizal interfaces, right? Basically, because these things are sensitive to extreme nutrient level or higher nutrient levels. They're also, of course, disturbed by the actual physical disturbance of soil. And of course, they're also basically oxidized as we expose them to uh, more oxygen. So basically all the carbon, all the biosystems that exist in these mycorrhizal systems are just oxidizing to carbon. And so you end up with basically an industrial system where we just have soil particles and roots. But in a way we have lost this mycorrhizal microbial interface between the roots and the soil particles. And so now these plants are effectively dependent on the hydroponic uptake of nutrients from the soil solution. Okay, so basically, as if, and I've drawn it here as a little straw, these nutrients are simply taking up nutrients that are soluble in that soil solution through the water that the plants are using to, for transpiration. So it's a passive uptake of nutrients from the soil solution. But the problem is, of course, that it's only soluble nutrients that are in the soil solution. Sure, we get a lot of the nitrate, sulfate, sodium that may be in that soil solution because they're soluble, but we basically don't get most of those essential nutrients that we need for plant growth, all the cations, the zinc, the selenium, the phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, etc., because these are generally bound, adsorbed onto soil surfaces, and they're not in the soil solution. We have the concept of cation exchange capacity, where basically organic matter and soil particles have vast numbers of negative charges on them. And it's these negative charges that adsorb and hold all these cation nutrients with positive charges. And of course, these don't then exist in the soil solution. They're bound and adsorbed onto these soil particles. And so these plants in, under industrial hydroponics, relying just on the soil solution nutrients, often have very great difficulty in getting access to these nutrients. So as a consequence, we actually have to add more of these in fertilizers. So we become dependent on having to add more, add more, add more to try and give the plants adequate nutrients. 
And so there's fundamental differences in how plants take up nutrients, whether they are grown naturally in soil or whether they are basically grown hydroponically in our industrial agriculture and basically need this constant input of higher fertilizer nutrients to get ad adequate nutrients. But there's a problem here as well, because while there's often then great deficiencies in the amount of nutrients that can be taken up from these soil surfaces, the essential cations, a lot of other nutrients that are toxic to plants, things like aluminium and acid soils, cadmium, heavy metals that are in solution will also be taken up by these plants in this hydroponic process. So effectively, we've lost the quality control system that nature provided us because we've destroyed this membrane interface. It's a bit like that first cell we had. If we go back to the first cell, it's a bit like if we destroy this membrane, then we're basically living back in the primordial soup and we're just trying to live off the nutrients, but exposed now to all the toxic elements that were there before starved of the essential nutrients and really we're going back to to really that yes that initial dead inert chemical state rather than a productive healthy plant and in a sense we haven't when we while we've understood the science of this for decades the significance in terms of now how does this affect our preventative health hasn't really become clear because in a sense we for our health need over 40 essential nutrients in the right as we said in the beginning concentrations forms balances and nature has actually always provided those to us through this mycorrhizal selective intelligent uptake processes the fixation solubilizing access uptake and cycling and in a sense, we have destroyed that. And as a consequence, the food that we are now growing and eating contains often less than a third of the nutrients of these essential cation nutrients that we need. And often they don't contain any of the essential micronutrients that we need for our growth. Take, for example, something like selenium. Okay, it's only needed in parts per billion, very, very small quantities, but it's essential for making some enzymes. Okay, enzymes are basically chain of protein molecules, chains of amino acids that have a particular uh, construction and they form around these micronutrients. And without those micronutrients, we don't have those enzymes. And in this case, selenium, we don't have perioxidases. And perioxidases are just one of those enzymes that are fundamentally important in killing cancer cells. So you can understand as we compromise our nutrition, we compromise the availability of compounds like selenium, even at trace elements, parts per billion. But having compromised that, we of course destroy fundamental biochemical processes. We can't actually substitute that by just adding more selenium because then very quickly we're in this toxic situation where we may be getting excessive nutrients, excessive concentrations of the, those nutrients that in themselves then become toxic. So we've completely lost the nutritional integrity of the, the processes through which nutrients are taken up the nutritional integrity of our food, and of course, therefore, our health. And it's actually this process over the last 70 years or so that has now driven the loss of nutrient, in, nutrient integrity in our food. As we said, it contains perhaps a third of the nutrients that it did pre-World War II, and often none of these essential trace elements. But it was also created major problems in health because it is these uh, associated with this lack of nutrient integrity 
that we've had the exponential explosion in diseases, uh, over well, obesity, overnutrition, diabetics, cancers, cardiac, you know, basically all these disease systems, autoimmune diseases. And these are now actually basically creating enormous problems in our health. As we said, over 70% of us are subclinically malnourished, and we've got basically health costs growing exponentially. In fact, we have now a $10 trillion a year industrial food system based on this model. And of course, that is supporting and driving a $20 trillion a year global disease industry because it's these lack of nutritional integrity that is basically driving much of that disease going right back to the greeks let food be thine medicine but having compromised our food having compromised the nutritional integrity of it we are now subject to this preventative health crisis and so the issue is well what can we do about it how do we actually go back how do we actually restore the health of our food, its nutritional integrity, and through that, our preventative health. And it's quite logical. We have to go back from this model of nutrient uptake and go back to what we've evolved in up to the Second World War to say, look, this is, in a sense, the processes that enabled these plants to actually take up the nutrients in the right concentration forms and balances essential for our health and so it's a question of going back from what we've done over the last 70 years and restoring these ecologies and we can again see that in perhaps in a slightly bigger scale here and i hope again can you see this one okay because yes. what i've got here is a representation it's blown up a bit of a mineral particle a small microbial a mineral soil particle and we've got here fungal hyphae growing over that soil particle. And we do this in science. We've got basically electron microprobes where we can look at these in great detail, but also look at the actual nutrient absorption from these surfaces by the mycorrhizal fungi. And what's really profound there is that basically we can understand how the mycorrhizal fungi by giving out exudates can actually stimulate the activity directly or through bacteria of solubilization processes. So what we've got here in red is the exudates coming out from the hyphae, very, very similar to the root exudates that plants are exuding to support the hyphae or the mycorrhizal ecology. And they're actually then solubilizing nutrients, whether it's, you know, basically I've got magnesium or zinc or phosphorus, selenium. And so basically this activity of these fungi are able to then solubilize these essential nutrients. And of course, then what happens, these nutrients are actively transported across this mycorrhizal membrane throughout the soil from the outside mineral world back into the mycorrhizal hyphae. Those nutrients are then transported through the hyphae and of course exchanged with the plant for the sugars that the plant is providing in that symbiotic exchange between the fungi and the plant. So we've got solubilization, selective uptake, translocation to the plant. And it's this process is this process for 3.8 billion years that has really driven the nutritional integrity of those plants, the nutritional integrity of our food, and our preventative health. And of course, it's this process or these processes that we have to restore. And of course, what's going on is very, very sophisticated because I use the word intelligent up here because what's happening if we are in a soil, for example, that has high uh, levels of zinc, so it's got very high levels of zinc that could be potentially toxic, these hyphae are regulating how much zinc is taken up. 
So it will take up the optimum zinc it needs for its own biochemistry, the plants biochemistry and our food, but it will leave behind zinc that is at toxic levels. Conversely, if we put the same mycorrhizae into a soil with very low zinc content, then these same processes will then concentrate the uptake of the zinc so that again, the hyphae biochemistry, the plant biochemistry, our food gets the right amount of zinc and basically has that optimal nutritional integrity. So it's actually acting as an intelligent quality control, selective uptake processes, taking the nutrients it needs, our food needs, and bringing those into the plant, or so that we need bringing them into the plant as our food, but leaving behind excess. And so it's doing that for all the different elements. So we've got this very sophisticated solubilization active transport, active translocation process. And it's this that actually gives us the nutritional integrity of our food. And it's this that we have to restore. And so really, um, it's not a matter of how many nutrients are in our soil. What matters is basically how active this microbial ecology, these interfaces are, to give us that right balance of nutrients, the right forms, concentration balances that are so critical for our health. And so it's really quite beautiful and profound how nature has evolved this intelligent selective uptake and how by restoring it, we can restore the nutritional integrity of our food and thereby our preventative health. So basically, this comes back to us now. And in a sense, what can we do about it? And that's really quite important because the issue is, yep, okay, how do we actually, um, how do we actually change it? What is our point of agency? And it's, again, very simple. We don't have to need, have all the complicated analyses and what have you. We don't have to go to every soil and measure how many nutrients in that soil, we can rely on this interface to do that selective concentration exclusion for us. But what we do have to know is how our food was grown, where our food was grown. Was it grown naturally in soil via these membrane processes, or as most of our food is now, was it grown hydroponically without this quality control interface. So all we have to do is to reassure ourselves that yes, our food was grown with this natural process. And then we can rely as we have throughout our evolution that that gives us the correct nutritional integrity for our health. But to know that we have to absolutely know how our food was grown. And we can only do that if we can relocalize food systems, you know, where it was grown, by whom, what processes, and yeah, what level of fertilizer input, cultivation, biocides, et cetera, they were using. So it's really rather than relying on globalized food systems where we have no idea how our crop was grown or how our food was grown, it's actually understanding that, look, our food has to come through these processes. And we have that assurance through knowing, yes, it was grown by these farmers in this way that we can be confident of the health of that food. Okay, so it's not the yield of plants that matters. It's not how the plants look or the food looks that governs its health and nutritional integrity it's actually not even the nutrient density how much you know how much nutrient concentration the question is is it the right nutrient concentration the right forms and balances we've got to be very careful just of density because yes we can increase density by just putting more fertilizer on but then that can often become toxic 
Okay, it's not the labels that we put on our food, you know, to say, look, here's all the data about nutrient concentrations, because quite frankly, we don't even know what nutrients we need in many of our foods. And of course, that changes rapidly, um, seasonally, location-wise, etc. So all we need to know is, yes, our food was grown naturally through these symbiotic membrane selective membrane uptake processes effectively was grown organically and we know that when we know how and by whom it was grown okay so this is really coming to a fundamental point because by selecting food that has been grown in this way we have agency right for the first time now we say look yes there may be 10 billion of us on this planet Yes, we may be living in urban concentrations. And yes, we may be dependent on having to buy our food. But if we can differentiate and discriminate on how it was grown, where it comes from, was it grown through these natural organic uptake processes? Was it grown with this, nutri uh, this microbial quality control system interface between the mineral, dead mineral soil and life? then we can be confident of its health and we can be confident of our health. Now, this potentially actually creates a profound change in actually the whole, well, nutrition of humanity and the health of humanity. Because each of us makes a decision when we buy our food. We're each voting with every dollar we spend on our food is it grown this way or isn't it grown? And once this understanding becomes widespread and people start voting with their dollars to say, look, I need nutritional integrity in our food, then actually we can rapidly have a profound change, but actually move the whole agricultural food production system back to these natural organic processes. Okay, now, basically, one thing is certain, of course, all of us will die, right? I mean, all living things die and then recycle these nutrients back into life. But what really matters is, in a sense, while we're living, that we're healthy. And it's a quality of life while we're living that is so critical. And we can get that quality nutritionally through respecting and understanding and restoring these processes. What also, of course, matters is our children uh, healthy and keep growing up. And again, we can ensure that by having food that is grown through these natural microbial processes. So in a sense, it's our wisdom in how we understand this and use that understanding through our food dollars to select food that has been grown in this way. And if we do, we can restore our preventative health, but in a sense, restore uh, a future for, huma for, for humanity. If not, we're going to be in a very, very serious situation because these medical conditions that we've induced through our industrial food systems that $20 trillion a year global disease industry, which is totally unsustainable, is actually going to compromise humanity and our future on this planet. So look, I hope this has helped understanding these processes of biofertility, nutrient integrity in our food and in our preventative health. I know it's a complicated understanding. I know it's operating underground which we have completely in a sense disregarded up to now i mean that's not quite right i mean all the rudolf steiner the albert howards the whole understanding of you know in a sense health has been based on this but we've tended to ignore it we've tended to look at health as a thing that we do after disease you know how do we stop diseases rather than how do we prevent diseases but if we can get back into this sort of understanding of our food and our preventative health then it's really profound for humanity's future so look i might stop there and basically uh open it up for your questions because 
while it's sophisticated and I suppose beyond what we've normally understood, it has a profound effect. And so happy to answer any questions you might have and clarify any details that have been hard to understand. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Walter. And sorry, I wasn't here at the beginning to welcome you, but Nate no. <laughs> stepping in. No, Dan, and great to see you. And I hope that again, it's been clear, but please let's have the discussion to clarify any points, right? I think it's great to have the, the monologue and then the conversation, and then it's an iterative process, right? The right. active learning. Um, I see a few questions here, but Faith, is there anything you'd like to bring up? Um, just from your I novel? <laughs> I wanna thank Walter for the visuals. Um, that was really nice to get um, a little, uh, yeah, for me, uh, it's nice to have a little visual um, detail. And so that was really nice. Thank you for doing that. Um, yeah, and, and look, uh, and now look in these, these webinars and this electronic communication is wonderful because we don't have to have all the air miles, but definitely normally we have a, a whiteboard and we can build yeah. up these diagrams, but we can build them up piece by piece so people can see the logic and understanding. So I'm afraid that they may be a little bit complex and confusing as one hit or as a, an overhead but let's just talk go through them any questions that there may be on them but yes look it's nature is extremely logical and simple and by understanding these processes through these visuals yes hopefully we can get that understanding beautiful well we've got a couple of questions coming in so i'll just start off here um carol asks Regarding seasonal food and crops, do the nutrition mix re help the body be more resilient, et cetera, with say the hot summer versus cold winter and with allergy seasons? So look, could you just repeat that a bit, Dan? A bit, do you have season, yeah. Regarding seasonality and what crops are, are you know, um, ripe when and what keep over the winter and things like that. Uh, the question is really about, um, does the different nutritional mix help the body be more resilient? Um, Right. Okay. So look, a, a two. Okay, let's do this at two levels. Now, obviously, from a soil point of view, now these mycorrhizal interfaces naturally are there. Yes, they'll be growing at different rates depending on the growth of the plant, and of course under conditions. But they're forever taking up the right nutrients they need, the plant needs, and therefore our food needs. So yeah, they're acting as a quality control, intelligent interface, providing the right nutrition in our food. Now then of course, the next part of the question is, all right, because we have different food in different seasons, are we getting the right nutrients? And the answer is yes, because basically all plants are getting their nutrients or 98% of all our plants were getting their nutrients this way. They were all, optimizing those nutrients for themselves and if we're eating a diversity of plants you know in our food then yes we're getting that comp uh, that correct um, balance of nutrients there's another part that i haven't talked about because i didn't want to make it too complicated actually uh, this is the interface the microbial interface in the soil doing that primary nutrient selection but as we eat our food, we've got exactly the same mirrored microbial membrane interface in our microbiomes and in our guts. Okay, so we can take in lots of different foods with lots of different nutrients. And then our gut microbiome will basically break that down. And basically our gut membranes our villi will absorb what they need across into our blood and exclude what they don't need and that of course goes out in excreta so it's the same i mean actually if we go back to the first one it's exactly the same process happening in our gut right we've basically got food coming into our gut it's external to our biochemistry effectively it's really you know like this basic raw uh, thing but then as the bacteria break that down in our gut they our body will take up 
what nutrients it needs across its membranes and exclude toxins. So again, our blood has that optimum nutritional integrity from what we eat. So we actually have two levels of quality control, the soil, that interface, but then again, the food we eat, we then have that quality control and our blood, our biochemistry then gets what it needs. Again, like here, the system. Yeah, again, like here, if we destroy that membrane inf interface, you know, if we have then toxins and what have you that destroy that membrane interface, that destroy that microbiota, then we risk actually having, and of course, we have that medical term leaky guts, and then we won't be able to exclude these toxins, we won't be able to get the right nutrients. And that's actually driving a lot of the disease we have, right? This subclinical malnutrition, the cancers and what have you, it's all coming from that disrupted microbiome, disrupted membrane, selective intelligent interface in our gut. So it's the same process, soil and gut microbiology. It's all based on these membrane selection, intelligence selection processes and exclusion processes. I hope that helps. I think it's extremely important to, you know, emphasize and reiterate and, um, you know, bring that point home that it's, you know, the pattern of life is applicable across the different kingdoms. The oh, oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, look, we, that's why we go right back to 3.8 billion years, that first cell. Yeah. yeah. And while it's got more and more and more sophisticated, no question about it, the principle is exactly the same. It's the concentration of essential and exclusion of toxin. And, and that's that membrane interface is the fundamental thing that governs life, but is also the quality control system that governs our preventative health. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Uh, I've got a... Um... Question from Valerie. She says, um, I appreciate how important it is to grow food in soil. However, I'm aware that in some urban areas, people are growing food in towers, etc., using hydroponics, particularly in areas where food insecurity and lack of access to grocery stores. So is hydroponics grown with organic solution better than synthetic solution? Or maybe she's Okay, look, Valerie, this is thank you so much. Soil. Very critical question because we yeah. make the point there'll be 10 billion of us. 70% will be living in cities. And so if we can actually have an urban agriculture, it's actually fundamental for securing our physical food needs, but also our nutritional food needs. Now, the question is, do we grow that urban agricultural ag agriculture hydroponically or do we grow it naturally, organically? And if we grow it hydroponically, we're back like in agriculture. The question is, do we know what the right nutrients we are, have to put into that soil solution are? And will relying on just this passive uptake from the soil solution give us the right nutrient concentration in our food? Very, very, very rarely. And of course, at great expense, and it's, it's just extremely difficult to do. It's inefficient. But if we've got urban agriculture where we're actually recycling organics, okay, we're actually using compost, we're using worms, we're using basically these natural microbial processes to break down our wastes and then recycle them back. And of course, we can have soil integrated with that. Then we can go in urban agriculture and have very sophisticated functional nutrient cycling processes and that's why we make the point here cycling so effectively urban agriculture through this recycling composting vermiculture process can actually more than meet our nutritional integrity in a sense cities then become extremely valuable effective gold mines right because think of it this way all the nutrients from agriculture are coming into cities. So cities are this wonderful, rich source of nutrients, but it's all in our excreta. It's all in our waste. And if we don't manage them well and safely, those wastes end up as pandemics, you know, as these 
diseases, whether it's cholera, typhus or whatever, we create these pan disease pandemic epidemiologies. But if we can, through urban agriculture, cycle these waste nutrients efficiently, then we can have a very, very productive, healthy, sustainable future based on these cycling processes, these microbial ecologies, this nutritional integrity. Beautiful. I think we lost your video, Walter. Is it possible? Oh, okay. Hang on. Oh, okay. There we go. Beautiful. Is that I was better? Just say, yeah. On the so, topic, there we, we have um, you know, this conversation about organic right now where there is a, you know, an approved process for using hydroponics to grow quote unquote certified organic crops, at least here in the US. And yeah. what I hear you saying is as long as it's a hydroponic system, it's going to be very difficult to have that functional effect and value of the biological system occurring. And so mm -hmm. you can still grow inner city crops, you know, in towers in soil, it doesn't have to be a hydroponic system. If you were to figure out how to do it so the roots could be in that in that relationship, then you could you could produce in urban areas crops of, of high caliber, but but the hydroponic system is much more difficult than a soil-based system. Well look actually yes, absolutely correct Dan, but also much more profound, much more important. It's a completely misnomer. It's a complete um yeah bastardization basically you can't grow organic crops hydroponically full stop yeah they have to come from the soil interfaces Depends on whether you're defining organic. Showing here hydroponically all our cations you know those essential 30 plus nutrients the zincs the calcium magnesiums seleniums etc which are on soil surfaces bound adsorbed onto soil surfaces aren't available hydroponically. What we get hydroponically is just the soluble nutrients that we put in, you know, your nitrates, your sulfates, etc. And so by definition, if you're relying just on hydroponics, you won't have these um, cations, you won't have these trace elements. And you, while you can put, try to put them in, they'll always get absorbed onto surfaces. So it's, it's a complete aberration. And also you don't have the quality control because hydroponically you're going to get all the, the toxic, you know, your aluminiums and sodiums and so forth that aren't healthy for our food and ourselves. And I'm so- gonna, I'm gonna use that quote, Walter. Yeah, Whatever please do. But the point is that, so what's happened, and I know the USDA, it's been a, it's actually been a, a, a bastardization of the whole concept of organic basically no it doesn't function that way and in a sense this diagram makes it very clear why it doesn't right because organic is basically based on soil and then the selective intelligent uptake of nutrients from those soil surfaces across these membranes by the active activity of these um these microbes just taking up nutrients hydroponically is like having a straw sucking up whatever's in that soil solution and of course we're now dependent on that and extremely vulnerable to that but look that doesn't mean that we of course don't I mean, of course we need water for growing plants in urban agriculture but yeah urban agriculture can be grown with soil it can be grown with recycled organic matter we have these very sophisticated but very simple wicking bags where in a sense we've got sovereign soil, soil that you can create yourself in an organic situation, in an urban situation, just by recycling your waste organic matter and really continually cycling those nutrients to produce ever more healthy, nutritious food. Beautiful. I'm going to I'm going to use your quote that hydroponics is a complete aberration in the future whenever anybody well, I, I said bastardization but you can use aberration because you're very you much more polite. <laughs> uh, great. Um, Leo says no question just to say that I really appreciate Walter Yana being a part of this and rising so early for it. He's a brilliant part of the series. Um, um, yeah, look, it, no, but it's not me, Leo. It's it's basically, look, see, I, I, what I'm trying to say is 
and we've known about this for decades, right? Look, yeah. this is how life evolved. You know, how we went from a toxic dead mineral world to one with, with live life in it. And it's this very process for 3.8 billion years that has actually evolved life ever more sophisticated. I mean, there's a lot more detail we can go into there. And it's really that process which governs health and life. And so it's not me, it's just sort of this recognition. And if we can get back to it, it will actually control and govern and regulate that quality of nutrition, the quality of health that we all depend on. I, 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 I've tried various ways of trying to have this conversation. It's interesting, you come from this deep understanding of the historical evolution of life, but a lot of people don't have that perspective necessarily, and they come at it from the arguments about, you know, access to food sovereignty of people in the urban areas and, you know, efficiency and things like that. So it's a, it's a deep conversation, but I, 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 I really appreciate your, your, your statement. So there's a number of more questions here. So I'm just going to move Please, on. Please, yeah. Um, uh, Lewis asks, how does easy ex exclusion zone water and fourth phase water fit into your presentation? Especially how is it part of or helps these three, those three diagrams you had? How much right. is it part of the vertical movement of evaporative cooling, nighttime thermal windows, and CCN, cloud condensing nuclei? Lewis, obviously. Look, uh, okay, no, appreciate. And that was a previous talk. And I mean, it all fits in together. I think the danger is we, I mean, life, nature is this all this integrated process, but we're trying to, in a sense, understand different components of it. Um, now, I, I, we risk confusing it greatly because if we bring that all together, but there's no question, obviously, then the water that's taken up by plants. Um, and of course, these mycorrhizal, this is actually probably important to say, these mycorrhizal plants are also taking up water from the soil, these intimate interfaces, uh, we've got that on the next little one, like they're actually taking up water. So you can see here, you've got these high full interfaces with the mineral particles, they're actually taking up water from these soil surfaces, often at four, five times the wilting point tension that plants can exercise. So basically these hyphae, because of their intimate contact, because they're actively taking up water, are actually able to get water from these soils way, way beyond the wilting point tension of plants. So this is critical in arid zones for getting survival water to the plant. Okay, so yes, there's a whole lot of other processes going on, but the risk is we complicate. But but basically, yeah, the water being taken up from by plants from these healthy organic biosystems obviously then do drive global cooling and of course drive the whole hydrological cycle, which does drive 95% of the heat dynamics of this planet. And of course, managing that is critical for addressing climate change and securing our future at that planetary level. Uh, it's in parallel with this health per prerogative. It's fascinating though, Leon, just how it's the same processes. We're back to the same fundamentals of how we do that. It's beautiful. <laughs> Hello, now, I, hang on, I think I might have a battery. I lost the visual, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm okay. Let me see. Okay, but look, let's keep talking. Um, can you hear me still? Yeah, we can hear you. I'll, I'll read another another question here. Another uh, question. Yeah, yeah. Um, how would optimum indoor lights versus sunlight affect growing plants indoors um, and soil indoors? I think the con the question here is if people are starting seedlings um, before planting them out and they don't have a, a good you know, greenhouse where they can get sufficient natural light. Um, what's the effect of, of synthetic lights versus sunlight? Okay. And well, look, basically, the, um, okay, yeah. plants take up light, the whole spectrum, different wavelengths. And so obviously sunlight is far superior because it's giving you 
it's giving you that whole range of essential uh, light frequencies. Whereas artificial lights, obviously one, it's costing a lot of energy to produce, but it doesn't have the full spectrum. And so basically that light, yes, it's better to do it. I mean, obviously in sunlight than hydroponically or in artificial light, both from an energy, but also that full spectrum point of view. Uh, I appreciate in the Northern hemisphere, that's often the light's often a limiting factor, but for most of the planet, it's actually water and nutrients that are the key limiting factor for the growth of plants, not light intensities. And so it's these nutritional processes that actually govern and limit most of food production rather than light, okay, per se. Yeah. But if you're growing it hydroponically, I would argue as much as possible, do it in sunlight. But obviously, if you have to extend and supplement, then yes, you can do it artificial lights. And then you can look at the frequency of uh, wavelengths that that light is generating. And with better frequencies, you can get better production. Now we can see your chest and your chin. Okay, here we go. Yep, yep, there we go. Right, good. <laughs> Thank you. I, yeah. Um, uh, we'll just we'll move on um so let me see um lorna asks how do you feel about the practice of foliar application of nutrients for increasing nutrient density of plants right okay thank you look yes we can actually supplement the nutrition of plants by foliar sprays because yes plants take up nutrients through their leaves as well but again it's it's relatively minor compared to this soil interface. And of course, it really only applies to some of the nutrients, you know, the more soluble nitrates and things like that, or nitrogen. But most of the other essential nutrients are actually coming only through that soil. And certainly things like the trace elements, the phosphorus and so forth, you know, it's 99% through this soil microbial membrane uptake process. There's a very important point to mention here that look, most soils on this planet, obviously they all come from stardust, you know, when basically the solar system firmed, formed, and then these are coalesced stardust geology soils. And so most soils have plenty of nutrients in them, but 98% of those nutrients are often not available. And the whole function of nutrient availability is totally hinged on the the microbial fixation, solubilization, et cetera, of them, right? So biofertility depends on the availability of those nutrients, not on the content. And by increasing the microbial activity in our soils by our organic agriculture, we can actually increase biofertilities profoundly without adding nutrients, which is in a sense how rainforests function. Right. But I think, you know, I, I, in, in general, perhaps foliar applications are, are soluble nutrients, but I think there's a lot of people in the biological space that are, you know, micronizing uh, trace elements and buffering them with humates or, or things like that and being able to provide that full spectrum or broad spectrum of tr trace element availability, which, as I understand it, may be helpful for stimulating the microbial activity coming out of the roots, which will help facilitate... Look. Overall, function. look, okay, you're, you're adding nutrients in the foliar thing, but of course, most leaves have um, a wax coating, so they're not actually, there's not me that many, I mean, a lot of leaves don't actually actively take nutrients, but of course, those nutrients wash off the leaf into the soil, and then it gets taken up through the roots. I so even you... if we're adding it as a foliar spray, 90% of that nutrient may be getting into the plant through the roots after it's been washed off from the foliage, right? Fair enough. I think people know about that and put surfactants in their sprays, but we can, yep. that's not your area of expertise. Probably we should just keep moving No, on. no, look, I mean, okay, I agree. And then that process exists and so forth, but as a proportion uh, of the actual nutrient balance of plants, the majority is from the soil. Yep. Should be from the soil in nature. Yep. And certainly we can. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously yes. Nature. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but yeah, I mean, the idea of having to purchase nutrients that are the primary source of fertility for your plants is absolutely um 
you know, it's great. great yeah, to okay. Uh, yeah, it's not, but it's, it's yes, it's the, that, the cost and so forth and the energetics of it, but also now the danger is that we then end up with a lot of toxic elements in those fertilizer nutrients. And we're adding them often in the wrong forms, the wrong concentrations, the wrong balances. And again, every nutrition or every nutrient can be toxic in excess. So it really gets to that problem. The quality of that nutrition is completely compromised, even though they're perfectly healthy nutrients. We can kill things with phosphorus. We can kill things with selenium at the wrong concentration. So it's not the content. It's the actual quality, the form, you know, that it's uh, as that plant requires at that time. And in a sense, the fungi have been doing that. These interfaces have been doing that for billions of years to provide that <laughs> sounds like, quality sounds like you're, pretty, you're pretty strong on that just don't screw around with them and let them let nature do its thing well yeah right. look they're our friends and really all we do is you know how do we actually bio stimulate and help them but look we're not going to re-evolve life on this planet we just want to revere it and live with it and live longer because of it i'm reminded of a conversation I had with Jerry Bonetti some, I don't know, at least a decade ago, where I was, you know, relatively new in this whole space and very passionate about soil testing and mineral balancing. And he kept saying, you know, you know, you got to get the soil working and then you don't really need minerals. And I was like, but you need this and you need that. And you have to test this and measure that and do the math. Yeah. And he's like, you know, it's really well, look, Dan, this is working. important, and it comes to it comes to something that you have been working on very closely. You see, the point yeah. is that, yeah, numbers. You know, like we as humans, we we want to control everything, and so yeah. do we need to know in three decimal points what the zinc and magnesium and selenium and phosphorus level of every carrot that we're eating, and the answer is. No, we don't need no. to know because we don't actually even know what we need. Right? Exactly. We don't even know what the objective is in terms of those three decimal points. All we're saying is, look, we evolved in this system, growing and on these nutrient uptake processes, these quality control intelligent interfaces. And if we respect nature and restore these processes, we can actually be confident and trusting them and then we'll now, there's some very yeah yeah very profound science that came through uh 20 years ago where we look at the different kingdoms of life and of course fungi had always been put down with the very very primitive bacteria and what have you in fact fungi we know phylogenetically in terms of their heritage you know the family tree are actually proto-animals Right. Okay, so these fungi that are doing this mycorrhizal symbiosis are effectively your great 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 grandmother, right? We missed our animals evolutionary. There are, they're effectively our great grandmothers, you said. Well, great 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 grand, a couple more generations there. But what I'm trying to say, they are effectively proto animals, right? And so their nutrition closely, closely man mirrors our nutritional requirements. Yeah. Okay, and if we can trust and rely that, look, they are taking up the nutrients that they need, that the plants need, that our food needs, then we can be respectful and say, look, I'm happy. They're the nutrients that I've evolved on and I can live on, right? Survive on. It's a bit and like if they can do it with, you know, because they've got this magic power, then we can do it because we've got that same magic power, right? But by en enhancing and stimulating and respecting them, and the we don't need to we those. don't need to measure everything at six decimal places Precisely. across fifty different essential nutrients, right? But we should be able to measure our, with our tongues whether a carrot oh, yeah. is good or not, and let and, that be and a actually, of look. And, and this is where all the work, and we we are actually then the bioassays. Our health, yes, is the bioassay. And our plants uh, is a bioassay. And then you say, look, this plant is growing healthily because of the nutrition. This plant has disease resistance because of that nutrition. And that's, in a sense, the measure. Right. It's the resilience, the resistance, the health of that plant. Right. 
and flavor and aroma. Oh, and oh, oh yes, and of course, of, oh, well, look, effect, effect all of the flavor there. is really a absolutely the flavors a very sophisticated feedback on that quality control on that nutrition. Yeah, absolutely. Great. I'm glad we found something we can agree on. <laughs> oh no, no, we do, we do. <laughs> Oh, it's good. It's good to have these have these uh, push it push the conversation back and forth. Uh, we, we've yeah. only got about twelve minutes left. I'm going to try to get a couple more questions in. Right. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how to say Roizen. Roizen. Um, um, what is the best way to encourage fungi into a system that was previously tilled? Thanks. Okay. Look. Thank you very much. This is again a key thing. Okay. We respect that this is the ecology we need. How do we re-stimulate it, or how do we restore it? Now, it depends on what we've done to our soil, how to, you know, how grossly we've disturbed it. But look, these fungi exist in all soils. There's no question that they're now operating often at less than 1% of their natural activity because we've disturbed them and destroyed them with, you know, cultivation, fertilizer, biocide, fallowing, all our industrial processes. But basically, we can restore them mostly by doing less harm right taking our boot off that soil less tillage less fertilizer let no biocides continual green cropping and they will in a sense progressively come back we can go much much further we can stimulate those fungal microbial ecologies and that's again as nature does it here are a whole lot of um, extracts, worm extracts, worm juices. Here are feces from animals. And all of these things are stimulating these biological cycling processes and rebuilding biological health. So it's just that good organic gardening uh, approach to our soil. But there will be some soils and that have really been so destroyed that basically we have to start again. And that way, and for those, we can inoculate the soils with these mycorrhizae from existing healthy systems. So we can take some compost or some, you know, healthy soil, and we can bring that into this degraded soil and re-inoculate, re-establish re these organisms, which will then grow again. We did a lot of studies on this, actually, you know, can we actually use these organisms in enhancing nutrient productivity in agriculture. I was working in CSRO, for example, can we bring legumes back into our tropical grazing land through these mycorrhizals, stimulating these mycorrhizae, int introducing them. And the, the message very clearly is that, look, in 95% of situations, the natural mycorrhiza are there, they're more efficient, and by re-stimulating them, we have a better response and trying to inoculate but if we are going to mars if elon musk wants to go to mars yes he should take some mycorrhizae with him because that'll be critical for colonizing mars trying to get food and plants growing on mars do you understand so where we've got these extreme primary soils yes we can bring that we've done that work for example mining waste you know overburden mining waste revegetation yes we can inoculate that has a profoundly beneficial effect great um faith has a couple of things she wants to say and we've got a, still a number of questions here and only yep 10 minutes left so i'm just gonna i'll just say that and uh, go for it faith i'll be really brief no, no. i love myco mediated nutrition mycorrhizal mediated nutrition that's beautiful and I wonder, what about brassicas, amaranths, chinopods, those that are not mycorrhizal, are the other filamentous organisms that they associate with performing the same action? Okay, look, thank you, very important question. Um, yes, uh, myco-mediated nutrition, I agree with you, but let's make it go further then, that all nutrition is only nutrition if it comes through these natural processes. The rest is just an adulteration, right? It's junk. But that's just it big root. Food, it can't be both. Right? Indeed. Yeah. That's what I have. But said. as far as far as the brassicas, no, look, these brassicas again, beautiful plant, and nature is always more complicated. No, they basically function as pioneer plants 
and very important colonizing plants because they're giving off organic acids from their roots directly. So they're not reliant so much on these mycorrhizal processes because actually they've incorporated those solubilization processes through their root exudates directly. But also, of course, they're growing in a soil complex. So the, all these organisms are working together synergistically, symbiotically, so that, yes, um, bacteria, actinomycetes are solubilizing nutrients, basically making them available. And then these other plants, competitive pioneer plants like brassicas are actually taking them up. So while they don't have their own mycorrhizae, they are certainly benefiting from these microbial processes in their rhizospheres and in the soils that they're growing. So it's, it's a much bigger zoo with all sorts of different, you know, animals, the primary producers, but also these exploitative, competitive carnivores and opportunists. Beautiful. Anything else, Faith? No, I'm going to let everybody else get their questions in. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, so a couple, um, I just want to see if we can get a couple more here. Um, Rika asks, so if most soils contain most of the nutrients, do we even need to do soil tests or should we just add and support the microbes? And I just want to say most soils, most nutrients does not involve, does not cover everything, but yes, please. No. All right. No, no, look. Okay. But it is an important, important thing because yeah. actually this is, uh, okay, I don't want to be too harsh on the industrial system, but see, soil tests are basically promoted let's, because let's in, in very... we're talking about people that are operating already from a biological paradigm. We're not talking about the mainstream yeah. massive, you know, ag culture. Yeah. People are yeah. trying to work in harmony with biological systems. That's, that's yeah. your okay. Problem. Okay, good. Because as I was saying, most soil tests are promoted to sell more fertilizer because hey you've yeah. got these deficiency therefore you've got to put more on more on more on right yeah okay and so that's the whole point of soil test but the point is what we've been showing and in a sense i hopefully today is sort of illustrated that it's not the actual nutrients in the soil the passive inert nutrients that really are the critical thing it's how many of those nutrients are fixed solubilized accessed uptake are taken up and cycled right. and so really the thing to look at is your bioassay your plant your plant in a sense its nutrition is giving you a better reading it's giving you a better reading of the nutritional adequacy of that soil than a soil test would so if you're using and you're seeing looking at your plants and saying hey that plant is chlorotic it's sort of perhaps lacking you know different nutrients whether it's nitrogen or magnesium or whatever it's reading the nutritional integrity of your soil through your plants as bioassays of these uptake processes which is okay, so I much more at that. the plant if you want chemical analysis look at the chemical analysis of your plant tissues and that'll give you a much much more uh, accurate reflection of okay what's missing now sometimes we do have to add nutrients right there's no question we've got very old leach soils in australia there was no copper molybdenum zinc and some of them and so yes we have to add these trace elements no question but in 99 percent of cases soils contain vast quantities of nutrients mostly unavailable and it's making them available that is the basis for biofertility, not adding more. It's Which, stimulating these processes and it's using the bioassay of the plant itself as our key indicator. Which may be a, a logical rationale for applying a foliar spray that has those nutrients in it. That ah, wonderful. Bioassays no, wonderful. Are not present. Right. No, this is absolutely right. Because now if we've got those bioassays, and then we can say, look, we've added different foliar supplements to those shoots. And then we can say what's what's missing or limiting by the responses from having uh, rectified those deficiencies, right? Yeah. So yes, as a diagnostic tool, those foliar sprays then become extremely valuable and powerful. 
All right. We finally found a reason to for Walter to approve. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> All right. We got four minutes here. Uh, uh, Rika asks, um, are there appreciable differences in nutritional integrity between hybrids and GMOs compared to open pollinated heirlooms? Okay. Well, look, um, again, this is complex. No, there's no simple answer to that. I mean, obviously, if we are if we're selecting plants, GMOs, which are only functional because of their high added nutrient concentration, don't have mycorrhizal fungi, then invariably those plants will end up totally dependent on this hydroponic input and almost guaranteed won't have those trace element balances and complexities that natural healthy foods do, right? So yes, some of that GMO plant because they've been selected for exploiting high additions of fertilizer and nutrients, won't have all this other balance. But otherwise, um, basically, you no know, genetics, selecting the genetics um, doesn't really affect this nutrition. Uh, there is one other important thing here. See, the Green Revolution was all about, um, well, fertilizing soils, but then selecting plants that could exploit that higher soil solution nutrition. And of course, we then really did a bit of a con here because we selected plants with a higher harvest index, i.e. more of the nutrients and crop uh, plant biomass going into our crop component. And so we were just cannibalizing roots to grow higher shoots or higher seed yields, right? And by having less roots and let re less root exudates, we're effectively starving this soil nutrient uptake process. And of course, by starving it, we're demanding ever more and more nutrient inputs. So we can muck up these systems significantly by genetics, by breeding, if we're not breeding for, in a sense, holistically healthy plants. If we're just breeding plants that have, instead of a 50, uh, one to one root shoot ratio, we have a plant that now has a, a one to 10 root shoot ratio, right? That plant will obviously be struggling to get water and nutrients and become more and more dependent on irrigation and fertilizer. And that's in a sense what much of the green revolution productivity was based on. Yeah. And again, we were just kidding ourselves and deluding ourselves in that process. <laughs> All right, I got one uh, just on the on the um foliar spray testing conversation bill and jay say uh john kemp points out that tissues show how nutrient uptake was over the past several weeks while sap analysis shows what it is taking up currently or more recently um i think there's probably something there and we don't have any time to continue the conversation but i'm, I'm glad to get into this um more actively we uh, no look absolutely uh, but john's right it's a sap analysis that gives you actually what's coming up from that root system. So yeah, that's giving you your current nutrient. Uh, actually, that's another important point. Thank you very much. Look, these things are very dynamic in time and space, right? I mean, yeah. I mean a plant will change its whole nutrient uptake needs and its whole nutrient uptake functionality as it develops. It will change it seasonally. And so this comes back again to trying to test things and measure things and know what they mean in three decimal points, it's impossible almost because things are just so temporally and spatially dynamic. Yeah. We're, we're, we're just babes in the wood in all what's going on. We don't actually have a full measure of it in any way at all. All I we can do again is trust our great, great, great grandmothers to give us that nutritional integrity that we evolve with. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful note to end on. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, no, thank you very much, Dan and everybody. And look, thank you so much. And I appreciate it's complicated, but in that complication, we can really get to the roots of our biofertility, yeah. our nutritional integrity, and our preventative health. And yeah, let's do that as quickly as possible. Our future depends on it. As you said before, it's actually not complicated. It's actually simple. It's life figured this thing out a long time ago. And let's just work with life and not try to 
get stuck in our heads with all the details and factoids. Beautiful. And just look at exactly that process is simple, but it's in an extremely sophisticated, complex biological world, obviously, right? And why bother trying to understand it all? If we just know our role is to support life. Well, and beauty, beauty is not needing to understand. It's just being in an awe of it, respecting it. Yeah, and having a healthy relationship. Beautiful. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, Walter. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. And thank you very much, everybody. And uh, it's been a great pleasure. And I hope it's been of value. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you.